Okay, welcome everyone. We are going to get started. My name is Adam Greco and I work for Search Discovery and I am the ringleader here of the Search Discovery Education Community, affectionately known as the SDEC. For those of you who haven't been to one of our webinars in the past, um, these are free educational sessions where we bring top experts in to talk about different topics related to digital analytics. It's free to join, and if you're listening to this and you want to join the group, uh, feel free to just um, go to the website of Search Discovery and look for the SDEC. I'll also put a link in the chat. Um, today, we're going to be um, continuing our series on data visualization, and I'm very excited to have our speaker here, Leah Pika. Uh, Leah and I met um, many years ago when um, me and many other people were blown away at her presentation at uh, a conference that my old company, Analytics Demystified, had done. And out of nowhere came Leah Pika, and, and almost, I want to say it was like a standing ovation presentation, and we knew that Leah was going places. And so she has crafted her skills, and she is now one of the leading authorities on how to kind of share data, present data. So I am going to hand it off to Leah and um, hope you guys have an awesome session. And I'll be here uh, all along. If you have questions, post to chat. Um, and if you have questions for Leah, uh, please use the Q&A area so that I can make sure that Leah can answer the questions at the end. So Leah, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you so much for that awesome intro and handoff, Adam. I'm really touched. And uh, hello, SDEC members. I'm so excited to be here with you. Welcome to my three pillars of data presentation webinar. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me. Just you know, want to drop in the chat, make sure everyone can hear me OK and see my screen. I hope everyone is feeling safe and well today. So I want to kick this off strong and remind everyone that we are gathered here today to learn about the biggest blind spots in your data presentation process that's keeping you from informing decisions, sparking ideas, and inspiring action. So I have a couple of requests to make this go smoothly. First, please take a moment to put your computers and phones on Do Not Disturb and airplane mode so that we can all focus on the training. I also appreciate your patience as we are in a digital environment and we never know just what can happen and we'll, I'll be moving between screens. So I suggest that everyone open the chat window to make sure you can see the messages and drop in your thoughts. Uh, I've actually posted a quick prompt for you. Um, I'd love for you to introduce yourself with your name, where you're dialing in from today, and one word to describe how you're feeling right now to be joining so we can get acquainted. So I'm Leah, obviously, and I'm dialing in from beautiful Bucks County, Pennsylvania, as I have been for the last seven months, and I'm absolutely stoked to be talking to you guys today. So one little thing, if you message someone privately, just make sure that if you want to message the whole group instead, change that back because whoever you message privately, it will go right back to that person. I've seen just a couple of uh, glitches happen that way in Zoom meetings. I'll do my best to monitor the chat, but I do have Adam right here monitoring and we will be doing the Q&A at the end. And if you have any technical issues, please send those to Adam as well. So I'm so excited to dive in. Without further ado, let's do this. So we're gonna see a couple people from Bogota, that's amazing, from Motor City, Suffield, Connecticut, also Bucks County, woohoo! Stephen, California, feeling relaxed, awesome. Welcome everyone, I'm so excited. All right, so the three pillars of data presentation enlightenment are designed to help alert you to some of the most common habits that we've picked up as presenters of data in a corporate setting that may not be serving our mission of getting our insights remembered and acted upon. And it all kind of starts for me to understand the answer to this question, if this scenario resonates for you. One of your executives calls you up on the phone and she's like, hey, can you come present some campaign results, delightfully vague, <laughs> at next week's leadership meeting? Okay, thanks, bye. And you're like, oh my God, you are so nervous because you wanna absolutely knock this out of, your, out of the park. Everyone who matters to your career is going to be there. 
and you, you want to absolutely nail it. And just a quick side note, I do hope that I'm coming in over the soothing sounds of my lawn mowing service outside. <laughs> Hashtag 2020. Uh, so just let me know if that noise is a problem. So anyway, you want to knock this out of the park. So here you are doing your thing, happily crunching your numbers and pivoting your number tables all day. And you finally distilled it into some shiny new insights. It's now presentation day and you're just showering your audience with your nuggets of wisdom and they're just such a rapt attention, right? Well, you take a quick look around the room or now in your online room on Zoom and you suddenly notice that you maybe don't have their undivided attention. Yeah? Glazed eyeballs, little drool, people doing that sort of glassy stare off to the side where you know they're probably looking at another window. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's really unnerving and you start to worry that all your hard work has to flown into what I call the dreaded data black hole. Yeah? Well, if that sounds familiar, you're not alone because there is something, there's an issue affecting global conference rooms everywhere. They have been for decades. And it is what I call presentation zombification. <laughs> it's where you know that you're losing them and you desperately, desperately want them to understand the value of your insights and what you bring to the table, but you just can't seem to keep them engaged. And it's not just affecting you. This is a big problem. This global issue is very expensive. It might not be that hard to believe, but a study actually found that nearly $500 million every year is wasted during ineffective business meetings in just the US and the UK. That's kind of staggering. That's a lot of moolah. So it's kind of no wonder that the trends have been going in a way where Forrester announced in 2019 that 25% of new hires and promotions would require data storytelling skills, the soft skills that we are not taught when we come into this workforce. And what I was finding was that I didn't have these skills. I knew how to crunch data and analyze it, but I didn't know how to share it. And I kept doing, I kept manifesting the results of this very famous quote that you're probably familiar with, but I kept going in there again and again. So can anyone tell me in the chat, what is the definition of insanity? I'll give you a second. Yes, thank you, Maggie. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was going into these data presentation meetings with the same skills, pretty much none, and expecting them to have a standing ovation for me every time. And I never got to see that through. So finally, I decided to stop the insanity and I got really metaphysical and philosophical. So I went on a very deep philosophical journey to find out answers to this very deep metaphysical question that is burning at the heart of all of this. Why do bad things happen to good data? It's perfectly sound, valid data. I've checked it three times. It's statistically significant. What is going on? What you don't realize is there's something else going on and you were not taught this coming in to the workforce. I'd like for you to meet your audience's brain. Hello, brain. So this might be hard to believe, but everyone you're presenting to in that meeting has one of these and it actually is built to operate kind of the same way in terms of how it takes in and absorbs information and is motivated to act upon it, okay? Yes, people have different preferences and whatnot, but the way that the brain processes information is pretty much the same. Now, because I didn't know this, 
my data presentations were failing two very important goals, and I want you to think about these goals throughout this training. The first is to maintain the attention of the audience as we're going. And being that the average attention span of a human being is less than eight seconds, <laughs> you have a lot working against you in this area. The second goal is to be memorable enough to make them want to take action on what you are talking about, which means remembering what you said days later. This is also quite challenging if you don't have the right skills. Now, what this means is rethinking how we normally go in that room where we vomit out a giant pile of stats and recommendations and random data points that don't tie together. <laughs> this is courtesy of our friend uh, Tim Wilson at Search Discovery. This is one of my favorite slides. And that is a big habit to break. And the other thing that we need to do is kind of break the notion that you do not need a fancier, or expensive data viz platform to tell compelling data stories during meetings. It's a big myth. It's actually quite simple. It just takes knowledge and practice. So I'd like to welcome you to the three pillars of presentation enlightenment, where we're going to focus on three specific areas that you can make immediate improvements to, to see a measurable dis difference in how people react and remember your information. So we're gonna start right with the first area. Be your audience. Well, what does that mean? Well, something truly magical happens when you take yourselves out of your own shoes and you place yourselves in the shoes and the perspective of the people that you are presenting to. But it's a little easier said than done. So you're a client or stakeholder, you know, what she said was, can you present some campaign results? And I used to get delightfully vague uh, requests like this all the time. And that's because very often when stakeholders go to stakeholder school, they don't actually learn how best to articulate what their needs are from a data perspective. So this is an opportunity for you to become a translator and a bridge between your data and what they are seeking. So that means kind of getting in their head, maybe kind of like being their therapist in a way and trying to see things and ask questions like, what do I really need? What do they actually need right now? Well, in this time period, they probably need financial security and stability. And you know that's related to the stability and sustainability of the business. They probably need an extra push <laughs> regarding a promotion or a bonus. They probably have a need to help the customer. There's all different needs at play, but you're not necessarily listening to the words that come out of their mouth, such as, hey, can I have every number? That's not actually a need. So use these questions to probe into that. You can also think from their perspective. Well, what's on top of my mind? What are the biggest hairiest goals that I have for myself right now? What are the big projects that I'm trying to finish? And you know, what's in the way of that? Or like, what is going to make me successful at the end of this month or quarter, okay? You also wanna think about what their obstacles are. What's keeping me up at night? What are the biggest roadblocks to being successful in the way that I want? What would make me successful? And when you look at things from your stakeholders' perspective and your needs when you're presenting, you're going to win from their perspective. And there's someone else that's going to win if you properly look at them that way. And if you're lucky that you have a stakeholder who truly cares about the customer, what would ultimately make our customers' lives better. And what I often find is that if you find a problem in your data that needs troubleshooting, and you need to motivate your stakeholders to do that, when you frame it in their needs, the stakeholders needs, you get the customer's needs met as well. So it's a little bit of changing position with them, but call them up on the phone and don't be afraid to have this conversation. You'll create so much value for them by showing them that you are invested in meeting their needs, not just by getting through the presentation so you can go back to the work that you really like, right? Can anyone relate? Let me know if anyone relates to that. <laughs> 
So once you have a really good idea, I mean, th this is a very deep, expansive process in terms of brainstorming your content for your presentation from a needs perspective. But I want to give you one tool that will transform the entire way you approach the theme of your presentation and what people take away from it. And it's from a little known organization that you may have heard of, not sure, it's TED. So obviously TED is known for the most thought provoking, most memorable talks around the world. And when I studied some of the aspects of each TED talk and saw what I could bring into this process to benefit, I hit upon a golden nugget that changed everything for me. Every single TED talk that goes on stage has to have one thing. It's called the through line. And it is the connecting theme that ties together each narrative element in a presentation. In other words, it is your presentation summarized in a single sentence. Can you do that with most of your data presentations? Or is it a lot of run on sentences kind of strung together that maybe don't relate so much to each other? And I think that that approach is what's holding people back from having people remember what the heck you said during that meeting. Another way that I like to think of the through line is called uh, a strong cord or rope onto which you will attach all of the elements that are part of the idea that you're building. Okay, so I imagine that I'm hooking this on one by one. So here is my formula for a compelling through line for your presentation as a way you can introduce what you're going to talk about, what you're presenting about, then you're going to hint at what you found, kind of the conflict in the story, and then you're going to hint at your solution or your resolution, depending on the kind of information that you're presenting that day or the story. So for example, I put together a few through lines from past presentations of mine so you can kind of see the idea. Our Q3 A-B testing netted a positive gain of 16% of conversion and could continue to grow another 10% in Q4 with our new test recommendations. I set the stage of what we're talking about, I hinted at what we found, and I'm increasing their anticipation and appetite with a potential solution. And that is kind of like the headline for your whole presentation. Next, our search marketing program efficiency declined during May, and we found three reasons for why this may have happened and what to do about it. Same exact formula. And you also may want to use a presentation to showcase a new platform that you have and convince people to use it. So we'll show you how the capabilities of our new email marketing platform could dramatically increase our engagement rates. Don't these sound a lot more interesting than campaign overview or decide on data something <laughs> or just data, which was an actual title of a meeting I saw once? You're wanting to try to get people interested in what you're about to say. And the through line is an excellent way of going about making sure when they walk out of their room, they could tell someone in the hall exactly what you meant to say. Okay, next. The second pillar that is super important, this is a critical juncture in your presentation process, which is to use your tools wisely. How you use your presentation tool and create that slide deck that you're bringing in is the make or break point for your success beyond having the through line and, and the right data, okay? So depending on how you use your presentation tool, you can end up with an amazing slide that, that acts like a wing person for you, supporting you and helping you along and cheering you on, or you could end up creating like a Kanye West who comes onto the stage and completely steals your thunder because it's so loud and noisy. So, you know, as we're thinking about the presentation tools that have sort of permeated our entire corporate culture, you know, I won't name names, <laughs> but as that has happened, we've started to adopt certain ways of presenting data on slides. So that has led to a really massive issue where we have 
really boring and kind of ugly and just absolutely bizarre presentation slides that have been plaguing our conference room and our audience's brains for years. I do want to point out that there is a bunny and a hot dog on the same slide here. Uh, it, apparently they are correlated in some way. I'm not sure how though. So it's easy to, you know, point blame at the tool and say like, oh, this is a PowerPoint problem. This is a Kino problem or Prezi. But I just don't agree. For me, it's a people problem. We need to empower ourselves with the tools that we need, kind of like a surgery scalpel. Is it the scalpel's fault if someone dies or is it potentially a skills gap for the person? Now, to be fair, what these tools could do a much better job of is imposing controls on us to enforce data presentation best practices. But not a whole lot of them do that very well right now, I checked. And I want to give you a couple of controls which are going to transform how your presentation slides look. And the very first one that I want to give you that it's a big one, but just hear me out. Bullet points. Bullet points are killing your presentation. That's probably why they call them bullets. I don't know of another reason why they would do that. This is the honest truth. The only person in the room that wants to see all these bullets like this is who? The presenter. And I guarantee if you do it this way, you will murder your, or your audience's brain, okay? So I wanna give you a somewhat disturbing analogy that I want to use to try to make this hit home as hard as possible, okay? Just imagine that you're presenting your information and it's presentation day and you're, you know, everyone's there who matters and you suddenly decide to stand up on the conference table or on the Zoom, I guess now, and you trench coat flash them. Yep, everything's hanging out, all the goodies are everywhere and their eyes are bouncing around and you're like, hey, up here, but it's too late. You've lost them because just like this guy, Bullet points expose all of your information to the audience at once and it distracts them, okay? So you want to think a little bit, you know, like how, why we are doing this. And that's what I wanted to understand as I was going through this journey. I wanted to know why do we love our bullet points so much? Because this is a really hard habit to change. Everyone is doing it. And I think that that's actually what's on the surface. It's just what we, a habit that we learned and pick up. But I think that at the root of what is happening is that we're using our bullets and our slides as a crutch to read off of verbatim in long sentence format so that we don't have to prepare our content and speaking points in advance. And I'm telling you that this is a huge mistake Repeat this mantra over and over. Your slides are for your audience, not you. Yes, they can be a guide to help you along and, and help you know, reinforce what you're saying, but that is what they're there for. They're not a script. They're a tool to deliver information into your audience's brain, okay? Your audience doesn't want to, you know, read a bedtime story to themselves. They want a conversation. They want a story, a, reg a data story. And I guarantee if you do this, you will lose them. Now, I learned this methodology or this uh, philosophy, I should say, from an amazing book called Slideology by Nancy Duarte. And in it, she talked about this idea where we learn to create ideas, not slides. Now, an idea can be, you know, a, a, a question that you have for the audience. It can be one of your data points, or it could even be, you know, a recommendation that you have or, or a test idea. But the whole point of this is that you're using only one slide to communicate no more than one idea at a time. I know that sounds, you're like, whoa, 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 what? That sounds crazy. But that's the idea. In fact, you may want to use more than one slide like this 
to communicate just one idea. And I'll show you a split slide technique a little bit later with data to show how you can create anticipation and maintain their attention. So what this means is that you'll need to take one, you know, <laughs> heavily bulleted slide and blow it up into a collection of smaller and more digestible ideas. Now, people are afraid of using too many slides because typically there's just too much on there, right? Okay, so this is important to understand. If you're doing this right, no one will be counting or noticing how many slides that you're using because each one will be working to support the information that you are talking about at that particular moment. Okay, that is the key here. Now, that's really easy for me to stand here and just say, well, uh, you know, just don't use bullet points anymore. What? But there are specific cases where you may want to do that with checklists or a group of related ideas. So I can't go over it here, but if you're interested in the solution that I came up with, I have something called the story point method. And it's a blog post at leahpeka.com slash better bullets. And it is literally the most popular post on my site because I think this is a huge issue. So I want to do a pulse check. I realize we're actually at time, but because we had those intros, we started a little bit late. But I just want to take a pulse check. How's everyone doing? We're still on board to keep going. Yes, awesome. Okay. So one of the next things that was really, really important for me to understand in the presentation process was these two ideas, simplicity and intention when it comes to design. Simplicity meaning take away as much as possible so that only what really matters remains and intention such as is everything I'm doing Ha, does everything I'm putting on here have a specific purpose or is it just some default formatting that doesn't matter? Okay, so the first part of doing simplicity and intention is not about what we're adding, but it's about what we're taking away. And going to ask you this very hard question. Can you resist the fluff as hard as that might be? Cat people? Self-identify cat people in the chat, please. Usually a lot of people are very reluctant to admit that they're a cat people, even though somehow they're the world's most popular house pet. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty, Steve. I appreciate you. So when I say slide fluff, what I'm talking about is ancillary, unnecessary, and repetitive visual noise that interferes with your message. So this is where branding departments come out with pitchforks after me, but I'm just the messenger, okay? <laughs> and thank you, Elaine and Donna, thank you. So here we go, here's the slide fluff. Logos on every slide, watermarks, giant page numbers, bars on the bottom and bars on the top and other fluffy doodads that don't actually add any value to what you are saying during the presentation, okay? Now, this is why branding people hate me, but here's my take on company logos. If you're seeing them on every slide, I guarantee that in an internal meeting, everyone is aware of the company that you all work for. So it's not actually communicating any information, but it could be interfering with things. And I know branding departments are sticklers with uh, templates and such, and this is part of what I teach in uh, my higher education, my courses and everything is how to work with departments like that. But this is just the truth. So if you can work with the simplicity of your interior slides and keep logos from the front to the back, then you should be good. Because honestly, all of this fluff is really distracting. It interferes with the absorption of your information, which is what you don't want, right? Number one. So I actually learned this information from two amazing books by Gar Reynolds called Presentation Zen. And what they helped me do, which I never got trained in before I started work, was they helped me learn how to design like a designer would. Oh, what? A designer? You know, we are designing information and you are transmitting that to a live audience. 
But what is incredible is that only 7% of professionals who present in a you know, corporate capacity get any design training. It is a huge skills gap in my opinion. And it doesn't have to be hard because you do not have to be a professional artist as evidenced by this really talented sketch. This is my best artwork, <laughs> um, but you do not have to have a PhD in design to make beautiful, simple slides that actually work. You know that I wish that were a pet alligator that was actually my dog, Hammy. Uh, he was a corgi, but case in point, not, a, not an artist. <laughs> um, so anyway, so one of the really important points that you can learn from a design perspective is to learn to harness the power of real imagery in your presentation. I honestly believe this is one of the least leveraged things in the whole corporate presentation world. We love our data, we love our diagrams, we love our bullets, but we're not using this very important tool set. One of my favorite books that I've read in my whole life is called Brain Rolls by John Medina. This book will just make you a better person in general. But from a presentation context, one of his findings was pretty amazing. He saw that vision is the human being's strongest sense. It's how we evolved from a survival perspective all the way back to our days on the Serengeti. And we are designed to perceive motion and people and things that matter to us. And that's why powerful and relevant imagery increases the recall of information in our brains. So when we put it with just bullet points, it's not, there's like less than a 10% chance it might stick a few days later, where with images, it becomes imprinted on the brain naturally, biologically. Now, images are your bestie for another important reason, according to John. They can stir emotion and elicit compassion within any audience, doesn't matter if it's stodgy finance people or, or whatnot. You know, that is why photos and National Geographic are such powerful mediums. Now you might be wondering, uh, how would I get my audience emotional about my web data or my mobile data? And it's a good question, but this is where you go back to how convincing them to take action is going to help make whose life better? Your customer's life better, okay? This is where that storytelling of your customer's journey is so valuable. Storytelling during a presentation activates more areas of the brain than anything else you're going to put in there, no matter how cool your chart is in Tableau. It will not be a well-told story. So how do we apply that to our work? Well, let's see, here we go. <laughs> this is how I used to present my data, you know, like 80% oh, of our visitors abandon our lead capture. Uh, this is because our page wasn't responsive, oh well. All right, is this a story to anybody? You know, if you're watching Game of Thrones, would you like start the show, you imagine them starting the show where they give you a list of bullets of what's gonna happen in the episode that the show's about dragons and there's a throne with dead people sword and most likely every character you love is gonna die by the end, sorry, spoiler alert. No, of course not, that's not what they're going to do. They're gonna have something like a through line and create anticipation and imagery. So you can get a little creative with your numbers and you know, put a picture of a disgruntled looking customer in front of a very important data point. My gosh, most people are leaving our landing page. This is not good, guys. He looks like he could be a customer who is not happy with our brand, which can help elicit that compassion and create motivation, okay? So play around with that. Look for real high def, high res imagery of people and situations and technology to boost that. Okay, so now, when it comes to using imagery in your presentation, I have really great news. Your data is imagery. Your data is one of the most powerful visual tools you have at your disposal. But just like, you know, everything else in your presentation tool, you have to learn how to use it right. And that brings us to the third and final pillar, maximize the absorption of data in their brain. 
Maximizing data absorption means learning data viz best practices that are not making things pretty, snazzy, and exciting, even though I've gotten all those requests. It's about using a combination of choosing the right chart and aesthetics. And that's where we begin, by learning to choose the most appropriate visualization for our message. You know, we are becoming inundated with choices from all new platforms every day. And I think Nathan Yao of Flowing Data quoted that there are nine ways to show composition alone. But I would argue that there's usually one or two best ways to present your specific information. And we'll talk about one of those examples in a second. Um, but it's a skill set that you have to cultivate again and again with the right resources. And that's something that I help people get trained with. So think about, you know, when you're choosing a chart, is it answering the business question that you really want to show? Now, in addition to choosing the best visualization, and there's a whole data viz methodology that I have, but to give you one of my most powerful tools right now, I love to do one of my favorite crunchy granola hippie things and do a detox every single day, okay? So we often find that when we create charts, whether it's Excel, PowerPoint, Tableau, whatnot, oftentimes it, the system itself will add a lot of excess junk to that, kind of like chart fluff in a way. And unfortunately, what that does is start to interfere with the absorption of the data in people's brains. So they'll stop listening to you and they're going to try to figure out what the heck your chart is trying to tell them. So doing this right doesn't mean dropping your data in this chart and like walking away. You are not done. You're going to design this data. So I want you to take a good look at this before, which was actually created using one of the presets in Excel. And what a truly detox chart looks like after the fact, where we've eliminated 3D, I've removed the background, border, grid lines, and axes, I've refined the font choices to be more clear, I've labeled data directly to get rid of excess legends, and notice uniform neutral coloring, okay? I've colored this to an emotionally neutral gray, which might be like, oh, well, that's boring. But that's because we often use color as this way of like spraying paint on a wall to the point where color doesn't mean anything. So what you're going to use now is you're going to use a standout color like this bright blue to strategically emphasize your story. What do you want to communicate in your graph? Do you want to communicate the largest channel of sales or the lowest channel? This is what data storytelling is actually about, is intentional design that allows you to communicate your story. Now, we're not done here either. A lot of times we'll just drop a chart on a slide and we'll put right in maybe, you know, the upper corner, the title, number of sales by channel. Boring. Everyone in the room is asleep <laughs> because you're not actually telling a story here. You're just telling them what this chart is. So I'm going to give you a trick where you take the most important real estate on your slide and you change it out with an observation or an insight that you have. It's what you're communicating about the chart. This is called a McKinsey title and it guarantees that no matter what they interpreted the chart or what they got from it, your message comes across crystal clear. This is the gold standard for HBR and New York Times and any place that produces media data as well. Now, I promised you before that I would show you how to split an idea to build anticipation. Here, I've added an ellipsis at the end, which indicates there's something else coming. So I can say, you know, this is what we saw, which, you know, we weren't surprised. However, we dug a little deeper and we found, dun, 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 that our efficiency opportunity lies with email, okay? So here, I've actually brought in a second chart side by side, and that's called a table lens, as coined by Stephen Few, the data viz expert. And what this allows me to do is 
share two different stories or at least split one story into two slides that allows them to build anticipation and have me tell them a complete story. So before we wrap, um, I actually put together a slide that you can take a screenshot of and in the handout that I have available for you, you'll also get this reading list as well. But these were some of the books that were really, really powerful during my journey. And I guarantee that if you wanna go much deeper on this, you're going to make <laughs> lots of headway. But I also have something for you at the end as well. So those are the three pillars. Let's do a quick recap to seal that stuff in your brain so you remember this tomorrow. First, be your audience. What do they want and need to succeed? And what is that main message of your presentation? Second, use your tools wisely. I have over a hundred slides in this deck that were very thoughtfully designed to send my information to your brain. And I hope that that's what happens. And finally, maximize the absorption of data using best practice data visualization techniques that help them remember what it is exactly you wanted to say. So I would love to hear, you know, this was kind of like a, a very quick dive into this, but I'd love to hear if there's one thing that you would do differently starting tomorrow based on what you heard today. You can just drop really quick and <laughs> I'll look through some of this and then I'll close out with some resources and I'll open it for questions. The detox, all right. Chart story, great. Real imagery is a game changer. Excellent. Bullet points, eliminate or at least reduce. Incorporate the through line, the chart title, more imagery, better titles. Oh, so glad to hear that this was helpful. So I know that some people had a few questions and Adam, I, I'd love to know how much time do we have left total? Yeah, so we can go as long as we have questions. Um, this okay. is kind of later in the day for most folks. Normally we're in the middle that. of the day and they might have meetings to run to. So um, so yeah, so let's, you know, we'll go. We don't have a ton of questions right now, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't opened it up yet. So if you have questions for Leah, please put them in the Q&A. I know it's very tempting to put it in the chat, but mm -hmm. if we put it in the Q&A, that helps really pull them out for us. See, it's like kind of like Leah's presentation, pulling it out <laughs> so we really get the key questions. <laughs> Um, and then we'll start going through them. So, um, Lee, is there anything else you wanted to share before we hit Q&A? Yes, I would love to just make sure people see a few resources that I have prepared for you guys. So if you'd like a session handout that incorporates everything that you've learned today, plus some extra resources, you can go to sdec, sorry, leahpeka.com slash sdec handout. And you'll be directed to leave your email, so it's totally opt-in, your choice, and I will send you that um, resource as well. And if you'd like to go a little deeper, I just launched a brand new online assessment to help identify your biggest blind spots and actually four and extra area as well and show you exactly what you can do to help get around them. So you can go to leahpeak.com slash killer quiz to find out what the heck is killing your data presentation success. So before we hit questions, I wanna just leave you with a little bit of wisdom from the late great Aldous Huxley. And that is, facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. And that might be true, but I think getting ignored sucks. And I don't want that for you. And I hope I've shown you just a couple of tools today that are proven science to help you not get ignored because your work and your insights are so valuable. It's time your organizations and clients know it. So let's go to some of the questions. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Look, while, while you catch your breath, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll shout out some. So oh, great. Thank you. Um, I'll give you the first one just so you can kind of gather yourself. So awesome. is there a best practice length for a presentation? For example, should you be able to get through your main point in 50 minutes or 30 minutes? Or is it possible to run an engaging presentation for two hours? <laughs> well, you're asking someone who does two day trainings for six hours a day. <laughs> so the thing is about time and engagement is a couple things. 
you take as much time as you need to make your point and drive the information into their brain. Yes, you can give a very engaging presentation for two hours. That might be more like a masterclass or a seminar that, you know, I would imagine that's a bit more instructional or educational. But when you are using the, some of the tools, and there are many, many, many more, but some of the tools that I'm talking about today are going to act as little uh, elves that are going to keep bringing their attention back to you over and over when they're starting to drift. When it comes to a point, though, I always want to pe people to make sure they know why they are in a presentation right up front and make sure like there's no question that the kiss of death during a meeting is someone thinking or asking someone, what is this meeting about again? This is not what you want for your meetings. You want it to be crystal clear. And that's where things like th the through line can help you in like a regular 30 minute to 60 minute meeting. And when it comes to two hours, you just wanna make sure that everything you're packing in there is gonna be valuable and that you're using these techniques to keep them focused. I hope that helps. Oh, okay. Thanks, so um, another question that we have here is what tools should we use to manipulate design graphs, etc., to extract for presentation use? Some tools are limited on what you can do to highlight the right key elements. And I'm going to couple that because I think it's kind of similar to another question, which is which platforms are better to visualize data, Data <laughs> Studio, Power BI, if you've worked with them. So it's kind of like, there's a common question, what tools do you recommend? Are there any specific? Oh, everyone loves the tools question, right? <laughs> yep. So my answer might not be totally straightforward because I believe in getting the foundation for data viz principles before trying to select a tool that you like, especially because a lot of tools are not free. And you, depending on what company or what role you change into, you may lose access to a paid tool. So I actually design everything I do, almost everything, and present most of my data right in PowerPoint. I literally will drop charts and create charts in PowerPoint itself because PowerPoint is the gold standard. If you're using PowerPoint as the tool, the tool itself is the gold standard for presenting simple charts like lines and bars. And if you're doing pies in a certain scenario or things like that, not crazy like Mary Mecco or dot, dumbbell dot plots and, and things like that. Um, I actually use it right in there for a number of reasons. First, you're going to get the best quality image if you're charting right in the tool you're presenting from. It will look great from any resolution and any size. Also, you're not worrying about copying something from Excel and it needs the data sets and then it breaks the link to the file if you don't send that deck to someone and all of that jazz. When it comes to using other platforms, for the most part, I haven't found the greatest degree of flexibility in changing things the way I want, except for Tableau. And I'm not like trying to be a pro proponent. That happens to be the sort of up-leveled tool that I grew accustomed to. Um, I actually do have an entire blog post on creating really simple detoxed bar charts in Google um, in Google Sheets uh, specifically, but it's the same principles in Data Studio. But when it comes to actually highlighting the data points that I want to show, I just find it a lot easier to use in PowerPoint or Excel on its own. But again, it's all about starting with the foundation and then seeing what is possible within each tool. If a tool is not going to let you do the exact visualization type that you want and you need something more advanced, then do that. I hope that answers the question. It was a long one. <laughs> yeah, the next one that I think is interesting is how do you handle variability in your audience? Most just want the key points, but others ask to see all the data. So how do you kind of serve two masters at once if you're in one meeting? Mm. This is a great question. So Basically, you want to get, get to the information that is needed to make your point. That's your starting point. Now, getting to know your audience 
that step is crucial here because you might say, well, this guy from accounting, he always wants these numbers. And this lady from marketing, um, she's going to want me to show all of the information up front. So you actually do want to tailor kind of the journey and the story that you take people through to satisfy their needs as soon as possible so you can get to the stuff that is most important. Sometimes I will have an intro slide when I'm setting the stage, and this is in a whole framework that I teach, but I'll set the stage and I'll show like a KPI slide and just saying, here's some context, here's where we are right now. This is, you know, setting the stage for what we're gonna talk about, but we want to really dive deep in something specific for this particular presentation. If you know they're going to not love that even, meet with them in advance, make sure they have their needs taken, or you can always offer to meet with them offline afterwards. But I often find that it's the filler stuff because five people want five different things that don't necessarily serve the greater good that you're in. And Leah, this is kind of related, so feel free to tell me if you feel like this was already covered, but um... Morrison said, you know, my issue is the opposite one. What if I only have five to 10 minutes and I have to get through a lot of material? Yeah. So again, that's where I think the through line is your best friend because, and, and ask yourself, where is the lot of material coming from? Is it because people have asked for a lot of material or is it a specific need that you think needs a lot of material? One thing I find with practitioners is we often feel we need a lot more information to explain something than we actually do. If we make things simple, create an analogy that makes it relatable, and we don't add all the stuff about how complex our analysis was or how long it took us or all of the details, they don't necessarily want the details. They want to know the bottom line, the, the, the through line of that. So you know, you can talk to someone where you either need more time or you need to figure out, do they need that much information and work your way towards starting at that through line and then expand from there. Uh, the next question that someone asked is, when you're thinking about building a presentation, like, do you start right on the computer or do you actually start designing kind of more like on paper? Like, can you walk us through just like, how, is it almost like making a movie where you're trying to like <laughs> come up with the storyline and what you're trying to say or like, what's your kind of thought process? So this is exactly what I teach in my online course and my workshop, like literally exactly what you said, a step-by-step -step process where it is starting from a needs assessment, which I, I go through nine different questions that I ask myself or my stakeholders every time. And I get kind of, that gives me like a blueprint for starting. And then I start to identify my data and the story points. And I, I actually lay them out in a narrative arc format that takes people through an actual story, which is mostly missing from our presentations, uh, which is defined as a specific arc. Of resolution. Um, so then I do that. Then I start to put things, all of my ideas and, and brainstorm all of the different data points and recommendations and images I want to use. And I, I put them all on separate post-it notes everywhere. And then I organize that in this overarching framework that I teach and get them organized so that all of them fit my through line. And then once I have that, only after that, I go to a blank Google Slides template and I start entering in all of my ideas as slides without designing them. And only when I feel my content is like 70 to 80% there, that's when I begin the design phase and I refine my story and my flow and I'm actually preparing my speaking points that early. So there's nothing wasted. I'm not surprised by anything and everything ties to that through line. So it's a process, but it works because it gives you a starting point and an ending point for what you want. Okay, cool. Well, let's do one more and then um, some of the ones if we can't get to them, we'll see if Leah can answer them in written format. Sure. Um, Jeremy had asked, what are your thoughts on interactive visualizations within presentations, mm. similar to what you might place inside like an interactive dashboard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you're timing it really well, and you, you have to be careful because 
when you are presenting and you are talking, something happens where their attention hits a fork in the road. Every time you change a slide, their eyes are naturally drawn to the movement. That's how we're wired. And what they're looking for is that whatever they're about to see is instantly corroborating whatever you're verbally saying. So the goal is that they look at the side, they get corroboration, they come back and they listen to you. But oftentimes what we find is that when we're talking over an animation in a slide, people will start tuning you out and only watching the animation because they cannot pay attention to two things at once. The whole idea behind multitasking is a myth. <laughs> so this is, can be especially problematic if you have like funny repeating GIFs because every time it loops, it's continuing to distract your audience and people don't necessarily know that. So if you're walking someone through an interactive visualization, I would make those interactions very stepped, like a very paced so that while you're talking, you're really owning the microphone and you're still in the driver's seat of people's attention so that they don't run off. So practice with it, maybe run it past a few people and notice are, there, are they sort of getting lost, is their gaze getting lost in the presentation instead of coming right back to you? Okay, cool. Okay, I lied. One more. Um, <laughs> someone put a question in that now I'm dying to hear your answer up for. So okay. how would you present bad results or negative conclusions mm. that the audience might not always like or want to hear, especially senior leadership? <laughs> I love that so much. I'm actually writing a blog post right now about presenting bad results. But in a nutshell, there are no bad results. One of my favorites, uh, there might be disappointed because there are expectations, but my favorite uh, online business coach for building, I love his mantra so much. You're either winning or learning. So if you're, a if you're winning, great, celebrate that, make sure everyone knows, yippee. But if something didn't meet someone's expectations, there's kind of a step-by-step -step way you can go in there feeling more confident, maybe not feeling so responsible because we get guilted at oftentimes that somehow it's our fault. And making sure people understand that no matter what, you are going to learn from that experience. So when you're preparing bad results, what I'll often say is be very frank, like, yep. So the big headline is that the optimizations we made last quarter didn't meet our expectations or didn't meet our projections or goals. Very matter of fact, you're not apologizing for being alive, <laughs> none of that stuff. If people are disappointed, that's kind of their journey in this. People create expectations. Now there's two things. If you weren't responsible, if it's just market conditions or it was a test and you couldn't predict how it would go, then you leave it there and you talk about how, what are the next steps you can do to make this better? And you very quickly follow with, we have a couple of solutions for you that we think are really gonna turn this around. And you're optimistic and that helps them feel optimistic. But if you go in there like someone died, that's how they're going to feel. So the energy you bring in is everything. Now, if you did contribute to what happened, it's somehow a mistake or something, then own responsibility for it. Don't try to hide it, but don't own responsibility from a shameful place. Own it from a place that you're owning it, you know? So bad results are entirely the perception of who they're being said to based on the energy that you're bringing to it and based on how you're presenting a solution for them. So I'm so glad you asked that question. Awesome. Okay. Well, Leah, thank you so much. It's always wonderful. I could hear you talk all day. <laughs> so <laughs> I always learn so much. So, <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, everyone, thanks for joining. Um, and if you have any additional questions, um, you know, you can contact Leah. She gave her information. So um, have a wonderful evening. And if you have anyone who missed this and you want them to see it, we will have a recording of it in the SDEC Slack group. So thank you so much, Leah. Yes, and I just wanna give you some parting words really quick. Always remember everyone, please, viz responsibly, my friends. 
Namaste. And get your hand out and have an awesome night, day, afternoon. <laughs> awesome. Bye, everyone. Bye.